I'm, I'm very pleased you could stop by today. You recently completed a film with Farley Granger. That's right, a um, film called Death Mask that's with Farley Granger and Danny Aiello was in it and Ruth Warwick. Uh, nice film. It's a suspense a drama, police suspense. It's a, it's a good film. I hope we'll be seeing it soon. I think United Artists might be distributing it. Uh, was it filmed here in New York? Yes, yes. We filmed it so uh, sometime last summer. I guess it's getting close to, to be a year now. And uh, we filmed uh, New York locations in Brooklyn, Staten Island, <laughs> all over. How did you find Farley Granger and Ruth Warwick, who were certainly very well, you seasoned know, to work yeah, with? Oh, Ruth is wonderful. Now, I didn't have a, a scene with her. I worked, uh, did all my scenes with Farley Granger, mm -hmm. and he's lovely, very charming man, very sweet guy. So it was very fun to be able to work with him. And uh, Ruth Warwick did an excellent performance. And of course, I met Danny Aiello after mm -hmm. the fact. He shot on different days than I had too. And he's a uh, very exciting, very exciting performer. How would you describe your role? Well, it's very funny. Ever since I've, uh, I'm mostly noted for my adult film roles. Right. And uh, now that I, I'm playing the R-rated parts, I'm, I'm the mother. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've become everyone's mother. I played a great role. It was, um, uh, it's pivotal. Basically, the story is of finding uh, the body of a, a small child. And this one man's obsession with, with finding the circumstances of his death, how he got there, um, finding his parents, and what have you. I'm the woman that they find in the end. We find out that it was my child. And you see the circumstances as, as to how, uh, how the, the child died in the first place. Sounds like a wonderful acting part. It was marvelous. It was marvelous. And we had a little flashback, which was supposed to have happened about 10 years earlier. So I was very thrilled to get it. It was done by an independent producer? Yes, yes. Richard Friedman was the director. And it was written by uh, Richie and uh, Jeff Goldberg. And you're going to be producing a film yourself in the yes. very near future. Yes, yeah. Uh, that film's called Island Fire. And we're hoping to produce that oh, hopefully in a couple of months. Down in Jamaica, it's a wonderful, wonderful movie. A uh, story about Annie Palmer. Mm -hmm. the, uh, they called her the White Witch of Jamaica. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> now, she's a, a real lady. She was a legend in uh, Jamaica. I mean, she really happened. She was in the 1800s, and she owned a plantation. She ran or was in control of about 3,000 slaves, and uh, quite a powerful lady, and she practiced witchcraft, and... Uh, very interesting story, I hope. <laughs> and uh, how did you run across this story? Uh, James Ingracia, who is an entertainment attorney and mm -hmm. uh, a friend of mine, uh, came up with a project and we shot the photo novella for it. A photo novella is sort of a, an adult comic book. Uh, it's very mm -hmm. popular in Europe and, and uh, South America. It's for adults and instead of using you know, uh, sketched pictures, they're, they're actual photographs. So we went ahead and did the photo novella for the story, which is in fact turned out to be the storyboard for the movie. So uh, I like the project, he liked the project, he's got faith in me, mm -hmm. and I certainly have faith in him, so I think it's a, a project we're working on together. How does one go about getting funding to produce a film? Various different ways. I'm meeting with a lot of people right now. Um, it seems in the business you, you run across a lot of people, or in life you run across mm -hmm. a lot of business people who are interested in projects and, and what have you. And um, I'm lucky enough to, to know a number of these people. And uh, they want to see me make the transition and I, I think they're, they're, they have faith in me. <laughs> Let's talk about that a little because um, certainly you're probably one of the first adult film actresses to start to actually make a transition. And well, you know, there, there are a lot of people in the X-rated business who have uh, appeared in, in straight roles. And uh, Jamie, Jamie's really, uh, well, he did a uh, part in Nighthawks. Sharon Mitchell has been in numerous straight films. Nobody's ever really established themselves as a so-called mainstream star. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd, I'd like to see it happen. Well, it seems that's the direction you're taking. Right. And you've certainly... You know, started to have success. Do you find that um, there's a stigma attached to being an adult film star so much now as opposed I to... Think, I think if we would have gone back five or ten years ago, I think it might have been an impossibility. But I think people are, are more open-minded and um, I think they're more willing to accept certain things and uh, 
I, I think it would be something else if I went out and tried to fool everybody and say, my God, that girl, Veronica Hart, sure looks a lot like me. But I'm not. And I did some, some good, I think, some fine movies, and I'm, I'm proud of what I've done. I've got nothing to hide. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I haven't hidden too much either. <laughs> and where do you get your uh, frankness and your honesty? I don't know. I just, I, I think uh, through living life, you hopefully learn something, and I, uh, I try to be as honest as I can. You grew up in Las Vegas, which uh, when one thinks of it, one doesn't necessarily think people actually grow up there and have right, childhood and there. Right, sure. They, so. they don't think about things like schools and supermarkets right. and, and what have you. They just think of glitter and uh, casinos and that sort of thing. How did you find growing up there? Well, I guess, uh, gee, I, you know, it was home. So I didn't know any better or anything else. I guess um, you have a tendency to grow up fast there. It's a very transient town. People are constantly moving in and moving out. And uh, I, I thought it was just great. You know, uh, if you live there, you're not constantly on the strip or you're not mm -hmm. always downtown. So uh, it was great. They have a fabulous theater department. I graduated from uh, UNLV, University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And I was very lucky. Got to do numerous stage productions, and I performed in the uh, Eisenhower Theater in Kennedy Center. Mm -hmm. We won the uh, American College Theater Festival for a couple of years. So you had started taking dance lessons when you were very young. Yeah, seven years old. Seven, which is uh, <laughs> what sparked your interest in dance? Oh gosh, all I can remember is that. Uh, three or four year old just looking at the TV and every time uh, dancers would come on my mom would say come on honey they're dancing they're dancing and I would run in and and uh, see what was going on I've always wanted to dance and as I started to get older I became interested in acting as well um, you had said that you were normal while growing up but not average how would you uh, explain <laughs> that well I how would I explain? That's a good question. How would I? <laughs> I think average um, seems to connotate um, a blending in uh, with everybody else and perhaps not standing out. I was always a bit different as a child. Uh, first of all, I was always involved in theater. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thespians always stood out from the rest of the, of the group. I don't know how it was in your school, but they were always a, a different a uh, different little sect in, in high school especially and I was also a debater I took speech and forensics and uh, I, I was always a, a little aside um, I was very bright when I was a child and, and, uh, well, that always sets you aside did you find that that led to ribbing from the other school children or yeah not so much ribbing but just that they didn't particularly want to associate with me I was a very um, obnoxious kid I was always the kid who was going I know teacher I know and it took me a while to learn to lay back and that you don't have to uh, always give the answers <laughs> how did you find that transition finding a common denominator with the other classmates you know I I guess it was becoming an adolescent when I realized that boys liked me and I found out that uh, <laughs> they were attracted <laughs> and all of a sudden we started getting along real well after that you had finished high school relatively early for most people. Right. I graduated from high school when I was 16, and then I graduated from college when I was 19. I took my four-year degree in three years. So I graduated, and uh, it was either move to Los Angeles or go to New York. And at that time, I uh, had been to Los Angeles a lot, going there for concerts, rock mm -hmm. concerts, uh, different theatrical events. And... Uh, I just decided that I, I needed to do something different. And I traveled all over Europe when I was 18 for one summer. And I'd also gone to Australia. So it was kind of a, a choice between going to back to Australia or to, to London. And I decided on England, and I lived there for about three years. How did you find the uh, social change from Las Vegas to London? Well, it wasn't as drastic as the, the European change. I mean, there was no language barrier. We both spoke the same language, and uh, it was wonderful. I really, uh, really enjoyed England a whole lot. I think uh, there again, you would stand out being an American because uh, typically they're uh, more laid back. Um, mm -hmm. They're not as ambitious, and I've, I've always had ambition. <laughs> and how did you find that as a foreigner? Did you find that that ambition and aggression was more helpful to you? Sure, sure, I think so. It's, uh, well, you know their economic situation over mm -hmm. there. A lot of the people tend to be a little bit defeated before they start. 
if you're not going to work and you're going to make almost the same money as if you put in a full week's work, it, uh, there's no incentive. So I was very lucky. Plus, I'm, I'm only about 5'6", five, 5'6". Six, five six. Not real tall. <laughs> and in, in Las Vegas, when I tried to dance in the lines, there was no way. I'd stack my hair up on top of my head, and I'd wear large shoes, and they'd take your shoes off and flatten your hair down, and they'd put you against a wall. And uh, I couldn't even dance any of the lines. But in, in uh, England, I was fine for modeling. I could model over there. I danced in the cabarets. Five foot six is a good height over mm-hmm. there. <laughs> Did you find that with English women they were threatened by your success because you were a foreigner? I don't, I don't think so. I, I hope not. You know? You'd also uh, manage rock bands in England. How did that start? Yeah. Well, to be honest, I moved over to England, I think, to find myself a rock musician I had always longed for. <laughs> <laughs> well, what better place to do it? Exactly, exactly. And I, I found a group, a group called Leargo. And I managed or mismanaged, I don't know <laughs> how I should say. They never, they never hit the big time. But uh, we played all throughout England, all sorts of different clubs there. And uh, tried, but never negotiated a, a successful recording deal. When did you decide to pick up from England and come to New York? I, actually, I went home first. I went back to Las Vegas. And I was in summer rep there. I did um, played Susie and Wait Until Dark. Right. Fabulous role, one mm-hmm. of my favorite roles of all time. And I played Lulu in the birthday party, Pinterest birthday party. And I was uh, an extra in a film called Going in Style. And the casting director said, you should come to New York. And a gentleman also had uh, read a, a big uh, article in a newspaper about me, saying that I was a performer and I'd been a model and a dancer and I was in the music business and had plans to, at that time to stay in it. And uh, he wanted to develop uh, a music business. So I said, my goodness, I better come to New York. Everything seems to be pointing there, which I did. So what were your first impressions of New York? My God, look at the buildings. <laughs> Everything was, it was big. It was more compact than London and certainly less charming. I found the people at first to be very, very aggressive and somewhat pushy. And when I finally got accustomed to it and acclimated, um, I found that New Yorkers are, are pretty right on. If you're blowing it, you'll know immediately. They will not let you get away with murder. But if you really need help, and if you really seem to be, you know, in a bad space, they're pretty much there for you. So I think it's a great city. Obviously, I wouldn't have spent the last five years here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> How did you deal with the aggression? How did you find out when to put your foot down and start becoming pushy? Pushy back, right? <laughs> Well, I'd always been a person who said, oh, never mind, no problems and everything. And uh, I do assert myself sometimes, you know. Now, I, if somebody pushes me too far, it's really being perhaps nasty. Or if I've made a, for example, uh, my sister and my nephew, her son, had come into town. Also, my other sister, I had two sisters visiting. And we went down to the World Trade Center. And I called before, and they told me specifically no jeans. Uh, so I got my nephew out of his jeans, and the only pants that we had around were some sweatpants. They weren't dirty, they weren't holy, mm-hmm. you know, they, were, they looked nice. He does, he looks like a teenage kid, that he does. And we went down there, and they weren't going to let him up, and I insisted. And we got in, but if I hadn't have <laughs> insisted. <laughs> well, sometimes you just need to give that a show. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I don't mean I'm mm-hmm. trying to go around pushing people around, though. No. Well, you've certainly come out of it very unjaded by it, your experiences in New York. And how do you account for that? Because usually people who come to New York, they become very aggressive and pushy. And yet it seems that you're really not that way. You can be when you need to be, but you can also revert to your old self. How are you able to keep it at an arm's length? I don't know. I I, I just, um, personally, I'm not... I don't like people who get overly impressed with themselves, where they've been, or or their importance. Because uh, I think it's important to realize that we're all pretty much the same. I don't care what we do. I don't care if somebody's a janitor or the president of the United States. We're all pretty well human, and I don't think anybody's that much beneath or above anybody else. And um, I don't know. We're, uh, We're all down here together just trying to survive, so try and make it as pleasant as possible. How did you find New York as a struggling performer? You know, I didn't, I didn't really struggle that much here. I, as I said, I moved out with a 
so-called legitimate casting director. Mm -hmm. And with that group of people, I found that it was who was doing what for whom and to whom as to as to who was getting ahead. And it was very much a game of uh, stabbing each other in the back and fighting for parts and, you know, if you know this guy, you'll get in. Mm -hmm. or, and uh, I just didn't want to play that game. It wasn't what I was interested in. It certainly wasn't the way I wanted to, to live my life. So obviously, our relationship didn't last very long. And uh, my music business uh, fell through. I presented him with a prospectus. And uh, at, at that point, uh, he said, yes, but I need match money. And uh, he was the only investor I knew. So I, that pretty much uh, took me off of that project. So I became a temporary secretary. And how long and, did that uh, last? <laughs> I did that for quite a while because it enabled me to work on my other projects. I was still kicking around the idea of an independent record label at that time. And, um, well, uh, enough kind of got to be enough. And by chance, the gentleman I rented a room from saw my acting resume and he saw my modeling pictures and he said, you should be in the movies. And he was talking about the adult films, mm -hmm. the X-rated movies. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I attract all sorts of things here. <laughs> and uh, I said, uh, why not? I went down and I saw one of the films, and it was nothing that I objected to. Um, I didn't think it was in, in, in bad taste. Uh, I, in fact, was thrilled. I mean, um, I had seen some sort of loops before, you know, and uh, they weren't terribly, terribly interesting, but here there were people who were acting. I mean, there were actors and actresses. Uh, there were people delivering lines. There was nice production value. There were scripts. Mm -hmm. These were real movies. And I thought, yes, yes, I'd like to be paid for this. I, I'd like to do this. I'd like to be paid for acting. Well, you had said in an interview that it seemed like it was a good idea in that in Hollywood you would probably wind up being thrown around a casting couch with a lot of empty promises. Right. I, I never ran into that problem with the adult business. Um, my job a lot of times was performing sex, so I never had to perform to get the job. And that's what I'm finding now. Um, a lot of the, the people that I've been dealing with, not, not all people, mm -hmm. but many of the people that are so-called legitimate and are, I don't want to associate with, I still don't want to have anything to do with. Uh, right now I'm very monogamous. I've got a wonderful, wonderful baby boy who just turned a year old. Mm -hmm. His name is Christopher, and I've got a marvelous husband, and that's where my energies are at now. That's basically why I had to to get out of the X-rated business. I found myself no longer able to separate my business life from my personal life, and uh, personally, I didn't want to be with anyone else. I really fell in love. <laughs> well, there is that saying that love conquers all. <laughs> sure did something. <laughs> uh, but how did the X-rated business change your perception of your sexuality? Because certainly you must have gone through some changes. Well, you know, I think it, I think if anything, I think it was a boost. I think as a performer, there's a certain amount of um, support we're looking for, outside support or adulation or something like that. And I think um, having found it with my fans, uh, having people write in and say, I like you, you're good, you're attractive, you're sexy, you're hot, you know. I think that, that made me feel good. I think it gave me a lot of confidence. And I also, uh, Michael, my husband, also helped support that mm -hmm. idea, you know. And um, I think it enabled me to be able to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship, a monogamous relationship. I don't think uh, before that that I would have been able to, that I would have been um, still trying to to prove myself as being attractive and desirable. And I don't think that's really conducive to a long-term relationship. <laughs> Did he feel threatened by your career at any point? or? Uh, I don't think it's a case of, th of uh, feeling threatened. I, I think it's something very tough to deal with. Uh, he's not um, any kind of a freak who enjoys uh, watching me make love with other people. That certainly is not the case. I think he enjoys the being with an attractive person, I think he enjoys the celebrity ness mm -hmm. that I have. I think that's fun. Um, but it's, uh, I have to give him a lot of credit. I mean, he fell in love with me, but I, I think it took a lot of guts to marry me. <laughs> <laughs>
to marry a girl like me. You know what I mean? How did your parents feel about having a son-in-law? Marvelous. I think <laughs> my parents were always very supportive of whatever I was doing in my career and what have you. But I think when they found out that I was getting married, they kind of went, <sighs> thank goodness. <laughs> What direction do you see the erotic film going in? Because uh, one of your best films was Roommates. Right. And it was really the first crossover film. Right, that's very interesting because the gentleman who, who did, produced and directed Roommates, Chuck Vincent, is now doing a lot of pictures for the Playboy channel. I've, I've finished some of those pictures, and those again are R-rated pictures. Um, I just finished a film called RSVP mm -hmm. with him. And I know he's producing another film called Delivery Boys. I had a, a very small role in. And uh, gosh, I really don't know exactly where the business is going. Um, I think the video cassettes in the, uh, uh, the home market has, has changed it very much. You can't depend on a theatrical release right now to bring you in so much money. Um, the X-rated business is not the money maker that it used to be, I think, because there's a, there's a glut of product on the market right now. And uh, a lot of people are now not even shooting for theatrical release. Mm -hmm. They're shooting directly on tape and releasing it in the stores, not even bothering with, uh, with the theaters. I don't know. Um, I think somewhere along the line, the adult industry and Hollywood are probably going to merge. And I don't know if this is going to happen in five years or ten years. What I'd like to see is a film with sex in it. I think that's healthy, and I think that's, that's where our head should be at. Not a wall-to-wall -wall sex film, although, although the, the, there will always be a place for that, too. But I'd like to see sex put back into its proper perspective. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a part of life, and it's a very important part of life, but it's certainly not everything. Do you think America's attitudes are changing towards erotic films? You know, I hope so. I hope they're changing towards the performers, too. Obviously. Or, uh, I mean, that's the position that I'm in right now. I was saying if, if uh, people will accept somebody who's very open and honest and upfront and uh, to see if, if they will support that, I, I believe it can happen. I mean, I know it is happening. It'll be interesting to see on how large a scale it can happen. <laughs> and how, how receptive do you think they'll be to that from well, see, the experience I know, you've had? I know, see, I'm mostly in contact with, with my fans and people are very supportive of what's going on. And they write in and they've been telling me for a long time, why don't you do other kinds of films? Why aren't you, you know, you're, you're a capable actress, you, you should be doing other things. And that's what I'm trying to do. That's what I'm trying to do. I, I love to act, you know, and uh, I'm doing that when I can. I'm also producing and directing for um, a piece called Electric Blue, which airs mm -hmm. on uh, the Playboy channel. And uh, I do that. I, I imagine I'll... Uh, probably for financially, I'll keep producing, and uh, artistically, I'll I'll keep acting, and hopefully, I'll be going on to to bigger and better projects. What direction do you see yourself going into, going in as an actress, from your experience so far? Oh, I'd like to play anything. I think as an actress, you you want to be challenged. Um, I I just want to play good roles. Who doesn't? What actress doesn't? Just just want to act. Uh, I just want to be. I would love the chance to work on perhaps a film that wasn't as low budget and to work with a couple of the really great directors. Um, yeah, I really like that a lot. I'd like somebody that can take the time and, and really tell me exactly what he wants and how to get it because uh, I feel there's a couple of real great performances in there still. <laughs> As a professional woman, who's also your wife and a mother, do you find it hard to juggle both a career and a home life? Very tough, Ryan. Very tough. Very tough. I uh, made it very difficult for my husband today. He was teaching uptown, teaching a, a camera class. Uh, he's a director of photography, mm -hmm. um, director, cameraman, lighting director. And um, I was late coming back, made him late. It's very tough to get... <laughs> to get child care. Uh, Christopher has come with me all over the place. He's made about oh four or five different trips back and forth to the coast. He's probably been on about four or five movie sets already. So he's a well-traveled baby, but uh, he's getting to that age where it's a little difficult to bring mm -hmm. him into meetings now. You know, He wants to go and play and knock over everything. So I uh, looks like I'm, I'm moving to a house right now. And if I can have a nanny or a house helper, 
it's gonna it's gonna help a whole lot. How has being a mother changed your perception of your womanhood? All I can say it's the best thing I've ever done in my whole life. And I thank God every day for that little boy. He's uh I don't know, I anybody who has a child that was really wanted and it's a child born from a lot of love. I mean it's um there's nothing like it in the whole world. And it's uh it's great. I'm <laughs> I'm very thankful. Well, Want to have one or two more, actually. <laughs> well, My husband said, please, we've got to have a vacation first. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully there'll be time for that in the future. Yeah. You've been very fortunate, and I really appreciate your time, taking time out today and your honesty. Well, thank you very much for having me on your program, Ryan. Thank you, Veronica. This is Spotlight with Ryan Keating, and our guest has been Veronica Hart. If you have any comments or suggestions, you can write to myself in care of Perot Productions, 640 10th Avenue, New York, New York, 10036. Spotlight airs on Manhattan Cable's channel D Tuesdays at 8.30 in the evening, and on Manhattan Cable's channel C Saturday mornings at 11.30. Be sure to join us next week when our guest will be singer Joe Maciel, who will be giving us some highlights from his recent cabaret act. Until next week, this is Ryan Keating for Spotlight. Thank you.